thank you for inviting me here to this wonderfully organized and, and exciting conference. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, thank you for joining me in thinking of how qualitative and quantitative methods might be fused when engaged in slow research with adolescents. These are some of the colleagues who have inspired and collaborated with, with me over this journey. Eva Edstrom, Ada Onyewenye, Christina McDonald, Awen Chu, Miriam Hurstein, Seiji Kwok, Hannah Nguyen, Jody Newman, Cynthia Pearson, Jenny Snell, Susan Trinidad, Brendan Egan, and Zoe Hayegel Strong. Slow recent. Mm -hmm. If you think about food as much as I do, you may have heard of the slow food movement with its emphasis on savoring every aspect of experience, on promoting the well-being of producers and distributors, and its focus on values. After saying I wanted to talk about slow research, I had to really ponder whether this was an appropriate metaphor. Um, but I think there's some elements in here. Part of it is savoring. We try to look deeply at moments in time. This means that we use multiple methods so that we can understand how teenagers act their actions and their emotions, values, and self-identity respond as a whole to social challenges and how those patterns of experiences may form the seeds of future well-being. In our case, the producers of scientific knowledge include those teenagers. So we try to design studies that benefit, have tools and, and experiences that might be beneficial for our, our teenagers. As I will explain, I want them to become self-ethnographers. If you like teenagers as much as we do, <laughs> slow reason, this is a pleasure. We've chosen to examine teen coping and harm doing in the context of what is sometimes referred to as bystander behavior or allyship. Specifically, how teenagers respond when their friends have experienced bullying, harassment, or discrimination. Such actions play an important role in teen self-identity formation and in the well-being of their friends. To help us appreciate this, I hope you will join me in a half-minute exercise. Please take the time to think about a friend, colleague, or teammate who wanted what was best for you and offered consolation or guidance when you had experienced disrespect, disappointment, or lack of belief in yourself. Please take a half minute to do this. I'll time this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now, I'd like you to consider the possibility that whomever you were thinking about felt pleased, maybe even honored, to have contributed, even in a, even in a small way, to your well-being, having made some kind of positive difference in your life. That brings us to teenagers who are rarely given credit for their efforts to contribute to the well-being of friends and to younger peers. Denying them this recognition ignores the people they are trying to become, people we would certainly enjoy knowing. That sounds good, but you might think, hold on, I need to publish if I'm going to get hired, stay hired, get grants, <laughs> the important aspect of your well-being. Despite pressures to do research fast, 
I'm suggesting that you can accomplish many of these goals by combining fast and slow research strategies. For that, we need a cornucopia of methods. We frequently combine observations, interviews, and surveys using qualitative and quantitative approaches. We think that mix provides a full picture of actions and teens' inner lives of emotions, values, and self-identity. Today, I've also described how that strategy has helped us introduce epistemic network analysis to new audiences. Our journey starts BQE, before <laughs> quantitative ethnography, <laughs> or the program evaluation. So you'll have to use your imagination to think of all the ways in which uh, ENA might have advanced our work. The task was to evaluate an anti-bullying program over two school years. We believe what we see more than what we hear, so Jenny's now trained 15 people to observe and simultaneously code the lunchroom and recess behavior of more than 600 to sixth grade students. As you can imagine, the logic, the logistics of coordinating multiple schools and coders meant there was not much time to save it. Those opportunities occurred the year before, as Jenny and I spent hours observing what we saw in lunchrooms and schoolyards. This informal ethnography served as a proving ground. It identified challenges and enabled us to fine-tune a productive coding system. We benefited from our early conversations with teachers. We discovered, for example, that teachers are really good at identifying the kids whose aggression is related to poor social emotional skills. But only a few were able to spot the socially skilled aggressors. Typically well behaved in class, they may even be teacher favorites. Ms. Hall pointed some out to us, saying, I don't know how you choose those you observe, but I know those aren't any problem. Well, those randomly selected students turned out to be ringleaders on the playground. Students sometimes formed an underground power structure based on harassment. As one shocked middle school counselor told me, we found out the whole school was essentially run by one student. <laughs> <laughs> This alerted us to the limits of relying on good hand reports. Our observations also alerted us to the frustrations and distress of kids who were harassed and then retaliated. Their efforts at revenge were often frantic, disorganized, and ultimately rewarding to their harassers. Revenge tends to create a, recurs a recursive cycle of revenge and counter-revenge. The vengeful act that seems fair to the avenger seems excessive to the target who strikes back. So we knew we needed to measure retaliation as well as harassment. Surprisingly, other researchers had not asked whether anti-bullying programs changed retaliation rates. If not for our informal ethnography, we might not have either. Sure enough, a paper with Zoe Heigl Strong showed that children who frequently retaliated in the fall suffered increases in spring victimization at the rate of more than one victimization rate per hour. This was in contrast to those on the right, green, who frequently harassed others in the fall. They experienced a similar amount of decrease in victimization. That gave us insight into one of the reasons kids who are chronically harassed may start harassing others. Looking back, we would have loved to have used DNA for sequential analyses of actions and reactions. That would have enabled us to see if the relationship between retaliation and victimization that we saw over time was the same in the moment. Wondered, given the risk of retaliations, what conditions support it? Three possibilities are closely linked to our research. One, 
It's difficult to identify the long-term effects of our actions. Two, people expect that revenge will be satisfying and reduce negative feelings like anger and shame. Three, bystanders and classmates influence retaliation. First, observations show that the long-term effects of retaliating can be different than the short-term effects. Jim Snyder discovered that when first graders retaliated, the victimization stopped in the moment. But the rate of victimization they faced increased over time. This teaches kids the wrong lesson, that they can stop victimization by retaliating. We are guided by theory that views emotions as a system of feedback-assisted learning. How does this work? Maybe on Sunday, I don't really feel like reviewing that journal submission, but I know that if I miss my deadline, then I'll feel guilty. I know this because I've been in similar situations. <laughs> These learned associations are stored in my memory as if-then rules. They remind me that I can anticipate, anticipate pleasure in the short term, but self-critical emotions tomorrow. So I compare and make my decision in light of the emotions I anticipate as a result of being a bit of a self-ethnographer. <laughs> <laughs> the second point is that people are motivated to retaliate by the expectation that revenge will provide satisfaction. When we fantasize revenge, areas in the brain like the ventral striatum light up, just like when we think about a good meal, or winning the lottery. But we wondered whether teens view past revenge is providing sustained emotional benefits. The third factor we considered was the contribution of bystanders. Harassers derive their power from bystanders who reward harassers with attention and often approval and status. Some bystanders are eager to see a fight and encourage retaliation. Teenagers describe the emotional overload in that case as a buzzing confusion when you're just not yourself. Fortunately, we have combined our schoolyard observations with survey questions about the value of revenge. So Zoe Heidegel-Strong, Ada Onyewenye, and I calculated how students in each class rated the value of revenge in the fall. We asked whether classmate values or personal values were more closely associated with changes in retaliation over the school year. We found that classmates' values appeared to affect harassers and their aggressive victims quite differently. Spring retaliation among kids who were frequent fall harassers was predicted by their personal values in blue. But spring <coughs> retaliation among victims who frequently retaliated in the fall was predicted by the degree to which their classmates valued revenge. Given how hard it is to think straight when you've been harassed in front of others, it's not surprising that classmates might have an outside influence. So if classmates disapprove of retaliation in the fall, Aggressive victims retaliate more. Oh, less. <laughs> One or the other. Um, if classmates strongly endorse revenge, aggressive victims retaliate more. Understanding the power of bystanders gave us a powerful tool. This is because the reductions in harassment and, and retaliation made by the program, while significant over 18 months, were dwarfed in magnitude by reductions in bystander behavior that encouraged harassment. 
the red line shows a 79% decrease. I should note that the blue line for the control group is truncated because we were able to recruit schools for random assignment as long as those assigned to the control group didn't have to wait more than a year for the program. This is the reality of, of um, this kind of research. The control group shows the typically near-end increase in harassment-related behavior. Aside from the fact that there was less harassment to watch after the intervention, we thought bystanders might be especially responsive to the intervention because of the ambivalent emotions they report when they witness harassment. Typically a mix of fear, enjoyment, excitement, guilt, and shame. In therapy, ambivalent emotions are associated with positive behavior change. We figured if bystander behavior is the most easily changed, why not start there? But we still needed to know more about how teenagers view their own actions when their peers are harassed or discriminated against. So we used mixed method interviews to find out how teens feel about their responses and what their actions and emotions mean for their self-identity. The research started with another informal ethnography, listening to cultural leaders, and observing in lunchrooms and sports events for two years. During that time, I saw teens using physical restraint to stop a fight, something I hadn't seen in the literature. Teens who were hoping their friends, this action seemed positive for both parties. Teens who were holding their friends back from a fight got to show their loyalty, and their friends got to act tough without actually having to fight. <laughs> <laughs> Pilot interviews suggested that teens spend a lot of time dealing with friends' emotions and social problems. If you're a parent of a teenager, this is not a surprise for you. <laughs> The interviews really enabled us to save our time with teenagers. Their life experiences vary greatly. 297 teens were approximately evenly divided between urban African American youth, urban suburban and rural European American youth, Mexican American youth in farm worker communities, and indigenous youth living in two tribal areas of the Columbia River Plateau in the northwestern United States. <clears throat> to understand the emotional consequences of several common bystander behaviors, interview questions asked about teens' efforts to calm emotions and discourage retaliation, their efforts to resolve conflict, Times they amplified anger or encouraged retaliation, and times they avenged a victimized peer, also known as third party revenge. This is the stuff of legends and hero stories. How did teens evaluate those actions in retrospect? We combined quantitative and qualitative methods to find out. We first asked teens to give us specific ratings of the emotions they felt after they had responded to their friend's victimization. Then we asked them to explain why they felt each of the emotions that they had indicated. The explanations provided insight into the goals that teens hoped their actions would accomplish, and also their assessment of their success or failure in doing so. You know that coding is slow research. But we had those nice emotion ratings, <clears throat> very fast to analyze. This was our first paper using ENA, and it was going to a journal on adolescent development. Although social network analysis 
analysis is common in our discipline. No reviewers would have ever heard of episodic network analysis. So we needed a strategy. I prefaced the network analyses with basic statistical comparisons of the ratings for each of the four bystander behaviors. For those comparisons, we analyzed three self-evaluative emotions, guilt, pride, and shame. As we predicted, guilt was highest for amplifying anger on the right, lowest for calming and resolving problems, and intermediate for avenging a friend's victimization. A similar pattern emerged for shame. Pride was the inverse, although resolving conflict was particularly high in pride, probably because it's so hard to accomplish. There was a pretty high failure rate, and when kids succeeded, they really felt good. <laughs> Notably, avenging a friend was unique in eliciting mixed emotions. Pride, shame, and guilt were all moderately high, reflecting that third-party revenge is a morally ambiguous behavior because it involves both helping and hurting others. But self-evaluative emotions occur in a context of many other emotions. So along with common statistical analyses, we use DNA with all the rated emotions, rated emotions to help us interpret our findings. Other emotions may have self-evaluative elements. Regret can be expressed in many ways. A few teens were sad because they were disappointed in themselves. My husband can tell you that I've been known to get angry at myself when I've made a very foolish mistake. Not uncommon. Emotions also modify the way other emotions are experienced. These interrelationships make DNA an ideal tool for taking a detailed look at teens' inner lives. In our network analysis, centroids and competence intervals show that avenging the friend occupies an intermediate position between calming emotions and resolving conflicts on the left, which are almost identical, and amplifying emotions inciting aggression on the right. After teens calm emotions, their pride was linked most strongly to relieved, also too excited. We were surprised to see the link to gratitude, but teens said they were grateful when their angry friends accepted their advice. This reflects that it's risky to intervene if your friend doesn't appreciate your efforts. If their efforts failed, teens felt shame and guilt. Not very often in this condition. Avenging a peer adds a link between pride and anger. Guilt and shame are also linked to anger, as are relief, sadness. We start to see some cold-hearted feelings emerge here. but not as much as in the amplified condition. Amplified anger sometimes consists of direct encouragement to fight, and sometimes it's not entirely intentional, as when friends engage in angry co-rumination. They review all the bad things the, harass the harasser has done, as both get angrier and angrier. Intentional or not, after amplifying tensions, shame and guilt are tightly bound to sadness, worry, anger, and cold-heartedness. 
Despite our pairing of DNA with familiar statistics, one reviewer was uncomfortable with a purely visual display. <clears throat> because DNA provides numbers for the relative strength of the links between nodes, we were able to provide a table of numbers. After the paper was accepted for publication, I suggested to the editor that the table was redundant, and she agreed. <laughs> <laughs> a numbers table was not necessary for the second DNA paper, but I still paired it with familiar statistics. Coding teens' goals is slow research. Teens' use of irony, sarcasm, and idiosyncratic vocabulary meant that we couldn't make use of pen code. In addition to coding the types of goals the teams referenced, we coded whether the action was perceived as promoting or threatening the goal or value versus promoting the goal or value versus threatening the goal or value. This is an example of the mean comparisons that prefaced our ENA presentation. It refers to the perceived success or failure of achieving one's goals. Not surprisingly, efforts to calm and resolve conflict were perceived as promoting team goals, here in blue, more than efforts to avenge or to amplify anger. Because it's hard to resolve conflict, we think that's reflected in the times teams felt their efforts to resolve conflict threatened their goal in red. Basically, they felt like they tried and failed. But amplifying anger is clearly viewed as the greatest threat to important goals. Consistent with the work of value theorists, we found that teams' goals range from self-enhancing ones, like gaining power or displaying confidence, to community-minded ones, like benevolence, expressed as being helpful. As you might expect, personal security figure, figured heavily, as did self-direction. That is, feeling that your actions were authentic and consistent with your self-identity. Again, we see that avenging a friend occupied an intermediate, intermediate position between the other bystander actions. What were the goals that teams cited when they amplified tensions? They felt that their action lacked benevolence. We have the link between threatened on the left and benevolence on the right. Some value theorists talk about benevolent values being in opposition to self-enhancing ones. But that's not the way teams usually talk about it. When bystanders acted in ways that threatened the well-being of peers, they also felt that they had threatened their own feelings of self-direction and authenticity. Nor did they feel that their actions were consistent with social norms of conduct. An indigenous male, I'll call him Dakota, was angry about the racist comments of another student. He encouraged a classmate to beat that guy up. <laughs> Dakota later reflected that having displaced responsibility for the revenge he committed <coughs> was inconsistent with his values. He said, sorry, because it's not the right thing to do. You shouldn't instigate something that will get other people in trouble, because you're not taking the blame. It's just not right. When teens unintentionally amplified anger, they did not feel that they had displayed confidence. And we see a link between confidence and threat as well. Serena told us, I didn't mean to make her rile up like that. If I validated her feelings, she thought that I would validate her actions, which I didn't. I told her they were very childish actions. 
But she went along with it anyway. <laughs> Confidence, like benevolence on the right, is linked to threat on the left. On a few occasions, recognition of harm doing emerged while participants were in the process of explaining their emotions. Eli initially denied his role as an instigator. Nevertheless, he described feeling guilty about his actions. Having to explain why he felt guilty, Eli ultimately revised his account of the responsibility that he bore for the conflict. We see a different pattern when we look at Fred's attempts to calm emotions. Here we see strong links between feeling you promoted benevolence and displayed confidence. We also see that benevolence promotes feelings of security and being self-directed. For both calming and resolving tensions, benevolence appears to be the nexus of self-affirming beliefs and feelings. As we observed in informal ethnography, calming emotions included physical restraint in 22% of the examples. Restraint could provide a breathing space and an opportunity to employ reasoning. As Jamal told us, I just kept pulling him back. Nope, you can't do that. Stay here. He wants you to punch him. Just leave him. It's not worth your time. He then reminded his friend of the consequences of long-term girls. You don't want to get kicked out of school. It'll be on your record, and that's not the best thing to have when we're trying to go to college. Couldn't adults have done a better job of diffusing the situation? I don't think so. Notably, peers were not offended by physical restraint that would be physical restraint that would be unacceptable from an adult. Shaquille saw a fight brewing among younger students and quickly decided that the most effective strategy was to approach the least emotionally aroused antagonist. I went to the kid who was about to blow off, not the kid who was already blown off because it was way easier to call that kid down. <laughs> I was like, relax, chill. He was like, no. And I was like, look at me, put your hands out. And he was in a fist, and I opened them, and I was like, relax, you're good. No wonder these teens are feeling proud and confident. Mm -hmm. This team made a sophisticated on-the-spot assessment of the situation. He injected a pause that drew attention to the face of a caring person and used soothing types of words. Again, we see that actions that promote benevolent goals are viewed as being consistent with personal values. Identity-affirming beliefs are especially clear in the team's developmental perspective on identity. Teens felt especially proud when they stepped into the role of informal mentors to younger teens. After the escalating intense situation, Jerome commented, since I'm a junior, they look up to me. <laughs> After that happened, I was like, if you want to walk around with me, you can. They did for a week. My freshman year, I looked up to upperclassmen. The thought that they were responsible for helping others was a valued aspect of the self. If we want to help teens become the people they want to be, we need to pay attention to these aspects of identity. So how do teens feel after avenging a peer? This was a common action, especially if a younger person was harassed by an older one. Research shows that people feel moral outrage and will punish those responsible even at some cost or risk to themselves. We see this in college students, in gang members, in parents. I'll 
also think great. <laughs> so teens told us they felt proud because they potentially helped their friend, but they also felt ashamed and guilty for having harmed another person. That's shown as benevolence being both promoted and threatened. We see the same bifurcation for self-direction, competence, and security. Our takeaway from these studies is, there, is that there are several strategies that can, communities can use to help support team goals. To promote behavior change, ask teens about actions that elicit a mix of self-affirming and self-critical emotions. Self-affirming emotions may support teens' aspirational identities and reduce their defensiveness about mistakes they have made. Having to explain emotions after their actions seems to stimulate teens' self-insight, perhaps by promoting the learning of accurate if-then rules. It might be helpful to provide visual aids that contrast the if-then rules created by different action and emotion relationships. Perhaps, we might be able to create on-the-spot subtractive networks of the participants' emotions, and that might accelerate learning of those rules. I'm quite excited about exploring DNA's visual possibilities. Networks that show classmates' patterns of values could leverage the power of social norms. Teens would see that others feel confident when they're benevolent, and insecure and inauthentic when they're not. Another strategy that Christina McDonald, Brendan Egan, and I might try is to videotape the discussions that teens have about injustices they've experienced, and then use video-assisted recall to emphasize differences in the links between actions and emotions. We hope to identify those that bring comfort in the moment and also support teens' well-being in the following year. Bystander research may shed light on another challenge for teens, exclusionary discipline. While there are many studies showing that in the United States there are racial and ethnic disparities in punishment, few have looked at the pathways through which disparities and exclusionary punishment emerge. <laughs> we do know that punishment, whether in the form of jury sentencing or fines levied in an experiment, is strongly, is strongly influenced by the desire for retribution and revenge. To be fair, educators, like teenagers, may experience moral outrage when they witness one teen harassing another. And it gets personal if the student doesn't show respect and threatens educators' authority. We used a typical fast research strategy, online surveys with hypothetical examples of common student misbehaviors. We asked participants to recommend the degree of punishment for each misbehaving student. The more adults perceive students as threatening their authority, the more adults anticipate being angry, and the stronger their recommended punishment. It's important to remember that educators' decisions are limited by what they know about the teens who have misbehaved. Many of the examples of responsible behavior that I've talked about are invisible to educators, or even to their classmates. They don't see the fights that don't happen. They see teens encouraging fights, but they don't see the guilt the teens feel afterwards. If you do community-engaged research, you may know that how to discipline youth is an area that can arouse sharp disagreements among community partners and among parents. 
We think teens' values, aspirations, and regrets reveal them to be morally sophisticated, multidimensional individuals. We wonder if hearing teen voices can reduce negative stereotypes and build support for more empathic discipline. We'll continue to look at this with a series of fast research studies and supplement our online studies with interviews. We'll ask principals to think aloud as they consider our hypotheticalist behaviors and to reflect on any past disciplinary actions that they now think were an error. Slow research encourages us to attend to the well-being of participants in multiple ways. For example, after teens harm themselves through moral self-injury. After one interview, Mario told interviewers about a boy he had frequently bullied. The boy had moved away, and Mario was distraught that he had never apologized. Participating in our interview enabled Mario to unburden himself to a sympathetic listener. One who could tell him that we all have regrets about things we've done wrong. And that's how we learn to be good people. Slow research requires that we humbly examine participants' moral challenges by, respect, by reflecting on our own moral struggles and on the humanity of those doing harmful acts. It's easy to feel outrage and harassment and forget that the classroom bullies are also our children. If we really believe that we should prioritize participant voice, then the questions participants ask us are as important as the questions we ask them. Answers to questions like, you get paid? How do you get a job like this? <laughs> can change lives. Of course, participant questions can really benefit our research. My colleague, Sue Trinidad, was part of a meeting of biomedical researchers and youth community members in Southwest Alaska. The topic was how to communicate genetic information with youth participants. A researcher suggested the group never share what they had learned, perhaps expecting a regurgitation of, of genetic facts from these participants. An elder dis disturbed those expectations by asking researchers to first share what they had learned. This question disturbed Sue in the best possible way. Co learning is considered essential to community engaged research. But as this elder wondered, how much were the researchers learning? And as Sue wondered, what happens when community members act to renegotiate their roles from learner to co teachers, ultimately shifting the power relationships? <clears throat> this question changed the course of her research as she saw elders move to become knowledgeable distributors of research, thereby affirming the normal cultural transmission of knowledge and ensuring that knowledge and the power that knowledge entails remains in the community after the researchers have moved on. Scientists are not always enthused about participant empowerment. Some have told us the team should not try to help peers regulate emotions. They may be understandably concerned that teenagers will encounter emotionally overwhelming situations. Sometimes that happens. But the reality is that teens view being a good friend as one of their most important social roles. They aren't going to stop, but that doesn't mean they should be left on their own. If adults understand more about teens' inner lives, those adults may appear more approachable when teens need support and guidance. As researchers, we want to provide information that teens really ask us for like what they can do that really helps their friends. We need slow research to understand slow development. 
I'd like to leave you with the thought that these interactions with friends help develop relationship skills the teams will use throughout their lives. As friends, partners, and parents, they will be consoling loved ones and helping them manage strong emotions. And they will try to guide the people they care about to act in their own best interest. Teens are learning these skills with their friends, as well as savoring the pleasure and experiencing the challenges of caring about the well-being of others. We hope we can assist them on this journey by teaching them to become inner self-ethnographers, to anticipate the ways in which different actions influence their emotions and their identities. Those identities as competent, benevolent people having moral integrity. These, after all, are the people teams tell us they want to be. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to interview you in your, to entertain your questions and comments. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, does anybody, would anybody like to start us off? <laughs> Thank you for that great presentation. It was just a pleasure to watch and hear about soil research. And um, from such an experienced researcher, seeing how you can tell a story using Kiwi um, really deeply and um, connect back to theory so clearly. So it's just a pleasure to see. Um, so, my question is can you make uh, a little bit of your research processes more transparent for us and maybe tell us a, a little bit more about? First of all, what what actually is informal ethnography? Like, how did you <laughs> how do you define that? It seems like that's that was the first step, right? And then, how did you go from there to developing these codes and then developing these these networks that you were so clearly able to interpret the links between the codes? Um, it just you made it look so easy. So, can you tell us a little bit <laughs> about the tensions you face when trying to go through that entire uh, passage? Well, Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, for me, formal ethnography can be translated as showing up, watching, and listening. Um, for our interview study, we were working with four different communities. And um, how the heck could we possibly even begin to come up with something that, that really represented all of them without spending time in the communities. Uh, it happens that this particular set of behaviors is one that I think is pretty common across all of these groups. Other behaviors you could never try to you could never try to comply. But but this is something that the kids seem to Feel pretty deeply about. Um, so, really, it meant at least once a month driving 360 miles, <laughs> sitting in meetings, watching basketball games. Um, I went to school plays. Um, this, this is very informal. <laughs> But it alerted, a, it alerted me to things that I really wanted to make sure we, we paid attention to. Um, for our codes, for their values and goals, we, we started with what is called a value circumflex, which is pretty common among value theorists. Um, of course, we ended up changing all the definitions. Uh, because they just didn't fit. And, and you know, that's that iterative process of coding that is so time consuming but essential. Um, yeah, I think that, that that's the most direct. 
there, <laughs> there are lots of other things like conflicts between the, com the communities we work in. But um, and then those were those were sometimes struggles. We had to be nimble to, oh, um, because there were sometimes very competitive relationships, and we had to be careful not to get caught. Uh, in that conflict. Um, so that I would say that was a huge struggle for us. Um, but you can learn so much just by showing up and, and watching. And, and we also went to community meetings. Um, there were um, anti-violence meetings. Uh, there were community groups. People were very generous in letting us sit in. I just, I listened. And I, I really got to hear what their concerns were. And that information helped you develop the codes as well as the theory, obviously. Yeah. You also interpret the links, is that what I'm hearing too? Like, well, that that yeah. just framed your analysis. Well, for example, um, this summer, uh, I stopped in you know, Montana uh, tribal lands on our way back from the Wind River Range in Wyoming. <laughs> And um, and I spent the day meeting with various people and, and really just asking them what were the problems that they saw in their schools? What were they trying? What were the resources the kids had? Um, and, you know, from that, I sort of took away a framework of things that, um, that we might have to address if we work with them to provide some kind of program. And so I go back to them and I say, this is what I heard you say, and, um, and these are some of the thoughts that came up in my mind. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Amanda. What I really love about this presentation is it, it got me thinking about how I think about learning and, and how I think about young people. And I, I find I'm realizing that I think about them as students too much, and I don't think about them as a whole person who has this complex life and experiences outside that role. And I've never really interrogated that before, and I'm so grateful for this presentation. And I wonder what would you, what advice would you have? or other researchers who might be like me, who are not thinking about young people or learners as this sort of broader, more complex constellation of motivations and behaviors and thoughts. Ooh, that's sorry, that's like a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, you have, if you have relatives, ask them what's important to them in school. Uh, don't expect to get a lot of disclosure. <laughs> uh, the best way to get disclosure from teenagers is to drive them around in the car. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, but you know, you could also try to retreat them. So I've heard that all teenagers sometimes take revenge when their friends are hurt by other people. Have you ever seen that? How do people feel when they do that? When we uh, when we interview kids, we we were careful to allow them not to tell us what they've done. There were only a few kids that took that option. And I will mention that out of the nearly 300 kids, there were three kids whose behaviors were outside the norm and who lacked regret to the extent that they, they showed kind of psychopathic symptoms. It's probably not what you're going to find in your relatives. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you if you let kids know.
know if you're willing to hear about those things, maybe even share something from your own life where you did something that you weren't proud of. Because of the fact that we ask about things that are important to them and we're non judgmental, it really creates a lot of disclosure. And that's why, after we've collected our data, we stay with those kids until they're finished. All right, so I, I, Javier has a question and, and I'm intrigued with it, but I just want to jump in for one second. Um, so it sounds like uh, part of what you're saying is that the only way to get this kind of understanding from kids is to actually get to know them, to track the relationship with the individual kids. Um, is, that, is that more or less what you're saying, that, that without, without that kind of qualitative relationship building, or you're, you're, you're not you're going to be able to see the kinds of things that you're looking at? Thank you, David. I think that's, that's a really good way of summarizing it. And, and in fact, um, I hear those kids' voices in my head. Um, because they really want to be a certain kind of person, and they don't often, always get the opportunity to be that person. I mean, Amir. Uh, I was very intrigued, thank you for the presentation first. Uh, I was very intrigued when you said at the beginning, uh, I want to make them real ethnographers themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, do they have access to, to these results, to see these visualizations about themselves? And if so, what was the reaction of knowing this? Um, well, I think our process of the interview is what brings out some of this. You know, what did you do here? What were the emotions you felt? That's pretty straightforward. Oh, this was a, a nine, and this was a one, and this was a two. And then, golly, you've got to tell us why that was a nine. And that's hard work sometimes. And sometimes, like with Eli, that involved recognizing that he'd been kind of a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it wasn't until he realized that he felt guilty of that. And he had never, I don't think anybody had asked him how he felt about it. So that was there, and that came out. So it was, a, it was a sort of a step-by-step -step process. First, you have to identify the emotion. And then you have to evaluate the ways in which it's connected to your, to your behavior. And of course, what we haven't looked at is what that might mean for future behavior. That's something we'd like to do in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I think I'll return to Amanda's question because I kind of have the same but I will formulate mine. Uh, to me, also, it seems that you're capturing uh, teenagers' ecosystems. It's, it's, they, it's not going to only be pupils, but it's, it's their entire life network connections, actions, emotions. So we zoom in on a particular aspect of their uh, ecosystem, life ecosystem uh, or life world. Uh, what I'm, I'd like to, if you wouldn't mind explicating a little more how the methodologies that you uh, presented and discussed here, or perhaps other methodologies that can be sort of brought into the mix, help to capture that ecosystem with all the elements and the relationships. Well, you've identified a very challenging thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are thinking, and we have a grant proposal, to bring in teenagers with a friend and have them discuss times that they've experienced injustice. Um, afterwards, we would separate the two of them and have them do real-time uh, positive negative emotion with a joystick or something like that um, and then we haven't decided either at certain times uh, 
maybe we'll ask them to identify key times in the interaction and, and then ask them more details about why that was the key time and what were their emotions at that time in more detail than the positive negative thing. Um, so, but the other thing is, um, we're also interested in working in a classroom um, because we wonder if one, when teens talk about these things, it's a process of discovery for the other teens. Now, the things teens tell us reveal so much vulnerability. And for these kids, that's not something they usually do. Um, can we help them appreciate that part of themselves and know that it's part of their classmates without actually making them vulnerable? Um, we, will, we will see, perhaps. Um, but it's also the opportunity for the teachers to get to know their kids in ways they had no idea that there was just so much deep thinking. I mean, these kids are revealing themselves to be uh, pretty sophist morally sophisticated. And um, how many? How many adults could could uh, observe that and, and not be touched by it? Yeah, I, my question is actually really similar or follows <laughs> along those lines. Um, well, I, this research is really fascinating, and one of the things that I was struck by, um, you know, I think a lot of at least those of us who work through American public education schooling, you know, the, the um, sense to which a lot of the perceived injustice is actually about the school system itself, not just about the other individuals in the system. And I'm wondering how much, the, and, you know, I was thinking of these sort of informal, I mean, deep observations you were doing, but also as you were interacting with, with kids, like how, how much did they, did they sort of point to the structural causes of, of this sort of, of these sort of issues, right, in addition to the interpersonal ones. Um, and I, I'm asking that mostly because the sort of the ecosystem point, you know, that there is, this, this is those cultures of schooling that, yeah. you know, that are different from school to school, but there are some similarities in particular in the national context. Um, and, and I'm just wondering how, you know, maybe your research has not gone in that direction yet, but I'm, I'm wondering how that kind of plays into this, because I, I can see there being real differences in, you know, whether, whether kids reward each other for, for example, de-escalating versus whether they reward each other for escalating and not based on the larger culture. Right. Well, thank you for that question. Both you and Karina have identified something that, that we haven't looked at and the kids really didn't focus on. Um, rarely they might say that they went to the teachers to report this. Um, but mostly, I mean, the emotional meat. <laughs> he's, he's talking about your friends. <laughs> um, so that tends to, tended to drive our interviews as well. Um, we are, with our, with our hypothetical things, we are going to try to look at whether getting information about teens in our lives changes the recommendations for punishment. I don't know how, how successful we'll be with finding out, but we're going to give it a try. Thanks. I want to come back to slow research a bit. Maybe you could give us some insight how to sort of build into our you know, plans you know, with slow research, because I think that's something that we have pretty bad at doing you know, in terms of this informal kind of identification of what's happening before we set out to do the research. And I was actually kind of struck, you know, by that because so many times, you know, I haven't done this little research and then I end up with the results, you know, that I'm not really happy with. 
Well, aside from the showing up, watching, and listening, um, I, I also spend a lot of time in self-reflection. I feel like I'm pretty adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and so it's pretty easy for me to imagine you know, I'm, I'm a kid who's gotten in trouble before, and I promised myself I wouldn't be in trouble. I wouldn't be in trouble again. Oh, here I've done it. You know, and here comes the DP, and I'm angry at this guy, and I'm angry at the, that I'm going to get in trouble, and I'm angry at myself for having screwed up. That's a huge, confusing morass of, of emotions. And, uh, you know, it's going to take time for my principals to, to work with that if they have any idea. Um, but when I think about it, and I think about, you know, when I get angry at myself, I don't want to talk to anybody for a few minutes. I just want to spend the time being angry at myself. And, and you know, it's very adolescent. And, and because my my husband is very patient. He knows that eventually I'll talk and, and he'll be supportive. But um, I think there's a, a certain amount of self-reflection and, and perspective taking that is really an essential part of this process. And just uh, how do you sell that to the founders? <laughs> 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 I hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer, but but um, but that's why I say you really need you know doing some a combination of fast and slow research, um, and and making use of you know like an online survey that doesn't really excite us, um, but it is a step that we can use. Um, to generate thinking and to, to write about on a grant proposal. Karina? Can I just follow up on that? Could we, if we use more like research technical terms, use uh, methodological triangulation as an argument for the funders, where we argue that uh, quantitative approaches and then also quantitative photography help but give us the overview, uh, the overall picture, and slow research give us the Dive in and analyzing that certain behavior for emotions or whatever, how difficult it would be. Karina, you're going to have everyone here wanting to have you on the next grant proposal. <laughs> 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 the next framework. <laughs> <laughs>